I am the manager at the KFC in Slovakia. It is one of the lesser known places, and since chicken is universally loved by most, KFC decided to open up a shop in Slovakia. Most of the chicken was imported and there was this sweet texture to it. Most of the raw material used in making was the standard material like every other KFC, and similar spices were used to make the KFC. Our place was bit off the city, but it was mostly packed during the day, and then in the night, like everything, it used to become the darker image of itself. The KFC had given us few liberties to create new recipes, since the Eastern European taste was pretty different, and the chicken didn't do much to the taste of Eastern European people. So we had the liberty of trying different things and different meals to suit for the local people. Even though it was called Kentucky Fried Chicken, our owner did not want us to limit the store with just chicken. So we used everything, and people loved it. Whatever the inspection people came, we just bribed them. It was easy to deal with when the inspection team was from Slovakia itself. It would be easy for us to just explain why we would do this, and they would understand. And I think even though we were the first to do it, there were so many KFCs in Slovakia that they were adopting our methods, because our methods generated more revenue than the others did. So everyone in Slovakia were cool about it. Us, the inspecting managers, our owner, and the people who were eating it. Then one day we heard the news that one of the inspecting team from KFC in the United States of America will be coming to inspect us. And moreover, they are planning on branching out further into the Slavic countries, and they wanted to start out the research from our place, since we were the highest revenue generating KFC in the region. We were informed that they will be arriving on the Monday. So the following Sunday, we had all our surprise of the different meats we were using to make the fried chicken. Even though we called it chicken, we rarely fried chicken there. We just used the alphabet of the meat we were serving so people would know. So if it said KFC bucket D, that meant it was fried deer and not chicken. And we did that with a variety of meat because chicken was the least favorite of the people and belonged to such cold place chicken was really more like under meal. The following Sunday, we cleared out everything and changed the menu and got rid of anything that made us unusual than other KFCs. They came the following Monday and introduced themselves. They were wearing their corporate suits and looked as straight as they can be and started inspecting the place carefully. They were looking at things that making sure that all of them were according to the US KFC standard, which I personally thought was stupid. Knowing what taste Slovakian people like, it was pretty sure that KFC would not even sell a single piece here if it was just the chicken. And they were measuring things and pointing out the slightest of blunders if they were in the photos that were displayed, or how the furniture was assembled, or how the things were visible in the kitchen in distance. We were just trying to not let them enter the kitchen. They were seated, and they ordered the chicken. And as we served them, they really liked it. It was the bland KFC chicken, and they liked it. Mostly because it was similar to the very chicken served through different KFCs. One of them must have realized something. He said, This smells different. Almost as if there was a residue or something else. Something with more flavor here. That guy was good and he was definitely the one we did not want in our kitchen to be. He stopped eating and said, I would like to take a look into the kitchen and see the process. I want to see how your employees make the chicken here. I want to find the flavor of that residue meat on the chicken. Take me to the kitchen. As we went inside the kitchen, he started observing our workers working and making the chicken in there and started snooping around. I asked him, what are you looking for, sir? And then he said, there is something fragrant in this kitchen. It is definitely not chicken, and I know it, because I know what kind of meat smells like. So are you going to tell me what you are doing here, or will I have to try to figure it out on my own? I was confused with everything that was going on, and there was nothing much I can say, and I started stammering, and he must have caught the lie. He took the hand off one of the workers, tool off the gloves, and started licking her fingers and said, See? Told you to stink smell. Something else. He continued, you tell me what it is, or I inform my supervisors that you are just not simply making chicken, but so much more, and I will make sure that you all get shit for breaking the KFC contract. 
and in that state of panic, I punched him right in the face and he was out cold. The kitchen staff looked at me as nothing happened and they picked him up, taped his mouth, and moved him to the cold storage where he stored all the meat. And just then, the other guy came in and said, They are hiding something their accounts don't match. They are hiding cash. And in all that, as he raised his head out from the book he was holding, he saw us putting his partner in the cold storage. And in that moment, one of our kitchen guys went up behind and grabbed him. We later helped and taped this guy up too and put them both in the fridge. Today, it has been a month since the incident and they are still in the fridge, frozen with their eyes wide open with all the meat. Maybe we might turn them into our menu. We're not sure about that at the moment. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. I worked in the complimentary breakfast area for about a year. Our job was to basically to stand around the food and answer any dietary questions guests had. We were also supposed to talk to the guests, get to know them, and make them feel at home. That day, there was a firefighters convention downtown in our city. The restaurant was full of them. They were all super nice, but there was one who was a little different. He was about 6'4". I'm thinking about 300 pounds, but it was all muscle. He was one of the biggest people I've ever seen in person. He walked down with a friend, and I greeted them. He said hello with an extremely deep voice. In fact, it startled me. I jumped in. He said, oh, did I scare you? I said laughing. I honestly just wasn't expecting your voice to be that deep. He chuckled. He went on to look around the food area. He reached for something and spilled some cereal. He looked back and apologized, asking if I was going to get him for making a mess. I jokingly said, we're really serious around here, so you better clean it up before we charge you for damages. He laughed. He got his food and then came over to talk. Here's how the conversation went. You're pretty funny, you know. I'm usually not this friendly in the morning, so you caught me on a good day. Let me ask, how old are you? That dreaded question that clearly indicates where the conversation is going. I'm 21. Great. The reason I ask is because a couple of buddies and I are having a party down at Insert Expensive Boutique Hotel, and I was wondering if you wanted to come through. You can bring a couple of girlfriends. Actually, I can't. I'm going out of the country in a few days, and I haven't packed yet. Which was true, but I would have said no anyway. Oh, I love traveling. Where are you going? I'm going to Ireland, Spain, Italy. That's amazing. I went to Argentina. It was beautiful. You know, since we both love to travel, we should be travel buddies. Now, I was thinking strange phrasing, but maybe he just meant we'll both continue to travel, but separately. I don't know. I love giving the benefit of the doubt to people who don't deserve it. Yeah, sure. He then reaches out his hand for a handshake. Promise? I hesitantly shake his head. Yep, I promise I will continue traveling. This whole time has been very jokey and lighthearted, but suddenly his demeanor changed. He sat down his plate and started frowning. Listen, you're going to give me your phone number and you're going to keep your promise. Don't tell me no. He got closer. Pinning me between himself and the counter, he talks quieter. And if you're thinking about it, you better have a good excuse. My anxiety was on 10. Thankfully, I happened to be by the exit door. I slid from between him and the counter and set on my way out. I'll have a great excuse and ran to the kitchen and never came back. Alexander Bean was born in the Scottish country of East Lothian. Sometime during the 16th century, his father was employed as a laborer with duties mostly consisting of ditch digging and hedge trimming. Alexander tried to follow in his father's footsteps and take up the family trade, but realized rather quickly that the hard work and measly pay did not suit him. He is also said to have attempted to train as a tanner 
and become proficient in the process of treating the skins and hides of animals to produce leather. The modernity and paltry wages caused him to become fed up with the profession. But it seems he learned skills that he carried with him into later life. Skills that would not only just provide a means of living, but a great deal of infamy too. Alexander was not like other people. He was rough, ill-tempered and violent. And he felt he simply did not belong around regular folk. So when he met a girl of similar inclinations named Agnes Douglas, nicknamed Black Agnes, due to word shock of black hair, as well as her distinctly dark personality, he knew he'd found his soulmate. Alexander's mother and father strongly objected to their union, having heard rumors that Black Agnes practiced witchcraft. So they told their son that he would be forbidden from living in the family home with his new belle should they choose to wed. The couple then chose to elope, leaving East Lothian and traveling across the Scottish lowlands moving from place to place and surviving on what little work each of them could find. But the couple grew contemptuous of their employers, as well as the work they were doing, and one night they hatched a plan to earn some easy money. They would lay in wait at a crossroads near to a tavern, ambushing, murdering, and robbing weary travelers as they trudged towards what they assumed to be a safe haven for the night. The couple's dark deeds then took an even darker turn, when at one point, during a robbery and murder in, in Ayrshire, they decided on an easy way to cut their cost. Instead of using the money they stole from the victims to buy food, they would simply turn their victims into food by dragging their corpses before butchering and eating them. Alexander was used to dealing with corpses of animals and found the human corpses were all too similar to the ones he'd worked with during his tanner training. After one such incident, Agnes and Alexander dragged off the body of their victims to a coastal clave and a benign head between Gerv and Ballantry. It was there they made a fire in which they roasted the poor soul's limbs, feasting on the flesh once it was properly cooked. The cave was almost 200 meters deep, and the couple discovered that during high tides, the entrance was almost completely blocked off to outsiders. They had managed to find themselves the perfect home, a subterranean lair from which they could launch raids into the nearby countryside, and one they could retreat to after the grisly crimes to avoid being apprehended by the law. The couple lived in the cave completely undiscovered for more than 25 years. Agnes and Alexander raised a family there, producing eight sons and six daughters, who in turn birthed 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters, all of which were products of inner family breeding. What began as a small family grew into something that more resembled an actual clan. And as time went on, the Bean family turned their bloody work into an industry of robbery, murder, and cannibalism. They began to strip on remaining scraps of meat and organs from the victims, pickling the leftovers in barrels so they could more easily survive during the harsh Scottish winters. They also employed the rather shrewd strategy of tossing the skeletal remains of their quarry into the sea, the bones then would be washed up on beaches far from the coastal cave they called home, leading terrified villagers to believe that it was, in fact, animals that were attacking and eating travelers at completely different locations, effectively throwing them off the beaten family scent altogether. Naturally, the frequent disappearances did not go unnoticed by the local villagers, but the Bean family remained hidden in their cave during the day and only ever ventured out under the cover of darkness to claim their victims. The methods are so furtive that the villagers were completely unaware that there was a group of murderous cannibals living right under their noses. As the years went by, more and more villagers seemingly vanished from the face of the earth. And the more they did, the more the local population seemed to take note. Eventually, several organized searches were undertaken in an attempt to find those responsible for the vanishings. During one such search, it is said that a group of men noticed the coastal cave that the Bean family had called home, but were unable to believe that anything human could survive in it, and thus failed to properly explore it. But if they had, they would have discovered horrors beyond their imagining. Unable to locate the culprits, the local townsfolks became incredibly frustrated and volatile in their quest for justice. They actually ended up lynching several innocent people, 
brutally executing them in spite of their pleas for mercy and totally ignoring their insistence that they were guiltless. They often suspected local inn's keepers since they almost always happened to be the last people to see the victims alive. Several were dragged from their homes in the middle of the night and hung from branches of large trees nearby. Still, the disappearances had continued. And then one night, as a married couple was returning from a local county fair on horseback, the Bean family spied their approach. They ambushed the couple, dragging the wife from her mount and savaged her as she lay in the road. Then they tried to do the same to her husband, but found he was not so easy to be overpowered. Little did they know that he was a former militiaman who was skilled in combat and carried a sword and pistol whenever he went out riding. The husband was able to hold off his attackers, but as he did so, he was forced to listen to the blood-curdling screams of his wife as the Bean family tore into her with knives and hatchets, carving her up while she was still alive. Eventually, after the husband had dispatched a fair few of the Bean family himself, a group of travelers, who were also returning from the very same county fair, appeared on the same trail and were horrified to have stumbled on the grisly scene that lay before them. They ran to assist the former militiamen, chasing the Bean family away with their superior numbers before escorting the newly made widower to the local magistrate to tell them of what he had experienced. Upon hearing the pure animal veracity of the attack and how the poor murdered wife of the former militiaman had been carred up and butchered while she was still alive, the magistrate seemed convinced that those responsible for the many disappearances over the years had finally been discovered. With local authorities sounding the call to arms, it wasn't long before none other than the Scottish King James VI heard of the horrifying atrocities. He subsequently made the decision to personally lead a search of over 600 men and several bloodhounds on a quest to find and eradicate the Bean family once and for all. Using clothing from the bodies of the slain Bean family member taken from the site of the recent county fair ambush, the bloodhounds were able to track a scent trail which led all the way back to the previously overlooked coastal cave a benign head. Using flaming torches to eliminate the cave's dark interior, the king's men found the Bean family surrounded by the spoils of their blood-soaked pillaging. Piles of stolen heirlooms, jewelry, clothing, and gold coins littered the ground around them. But what lined the walls of the cave made the king's men's blood turn to ice in their veins? Chunks of meat, human meat, hung dry from ropes that were strung above their heads. Barrel after barrel was stuffed with pickled human organ meat. The smell was enough to turn a man's stomach, but it wasn't nearly as disturbing as the inbred features of the clan that cowered before them. The majority of the family, mostly women and girls, were captured alive without a fight and dragged wailing from the cave by the furious king's men. But many of the men and boys ran into the depths of the cave and refused to come out, barking out that they would kill any man that tried to take them. Instead of risking their lives to root them out, the king's men placed gunpowder at the cave's entrance, blowing the opening sky high and ensuring that anything that remained inside would surely suffocate. Those that were captured were initially taken to jail in Edinburgh before being transferred off to Glasgow. Their captors were extremely disturbed by the family's lack of humanity, both in their physical appearance as well as in their morality, seeing them as no better than animals. The king's men subjected the Bean family to summary executions, believing they were too inhumane to even store in proper jail. Alexander Bean, the family patriarch, was subjected to a terrible retribution for the crimes he had masterminded. The king's men cut off his private parts and burned them before his eyes, a visual metaphor that he would never again pass on this rotten seed. He then had his hands and feet severed and was made to bleed to death, a slow and painful end to a truly evil man. As he was dying, he supposedly screamed out, It isn't over. It will never be over. Hinting, that some of the family had actually survived the raid by the king's men. After this, Agnes and the rest of the women, along with a number of the Bean children, are tied to stakes and burned alive. 
There may have been some truth to Alexander's claims that some of his ilk had survived the raid, as in the nearby town of Gabon. There are those that speak of a woman who appeared amongst the populace not long after the raid of the Beans Coastal Cave home. Apparently, after being interrogated by the locals regarding her origins, she admitted to being an escaped member of the Bean family, who were, by that point, infamous for their murder and debauchery. She was reportedly taken to a nearby tree and hung from a bow while the Gabon mob roared with approval. Over the years that followed, truth passed into rumor, which in turn passed into legend. In these days, there are so many who dispute that Alexander Bean and his cannibalistic family even existed. The fact that Alexander earned the nickname Sonny Bean during the time that followed is a derogatory name given the Scots by their English neighbors. There is quite a flimsy argument that the whole story was concocted by Englishmen simply to give Scotland a bad name, but a remarkably similar account can be found in a book by Nathaniel Crouch, a compiler of popular history writer, who published his work in the year of 1696. In it, he tells the tale of an incident which supposedly happened in 1459, the year before King James II's death. A passage from it reads as follows. A thief who lived privately in a den with his wife and children were all burned alive, having made it their practice for many years to kill young people and eat them. Only one girl of the family was saved and brought up to the Dundee, who at 12 years of age was found guilty of the same horrid crime when great multitudes witnessed her execution. Wandering at her unnatural villainy, she turned toward them and with a cruel countenance said, What do you thus rail at me? As if I had done such a heinous act contrary to the nature of men. I tell you that if a few did know how pleasant the taste of man's flesh was, none of you would forbear to eat it. And thus, with an impenitent and stubborn mind, she suffered a deserved death. What's clear from this testimony is that even if some of the details have gotten confused or twisted over the course of centuries that followed, there was indeed a family of cannibals up in Scotland, maybe even more than one, a family that didn't just eat human flesh because they were forced to do so out of poverty, but because they actually enjoyed it. <laughs>